because we were lucky enough to attend a session with Google Earth Outreach and the Institute at the Golden Gate last month. So on behalf of myself, Michael Norelli, Ben Fash, and Melissa Sang, we just all wanted to thank you so much for coming to hear a little bit about what we've learned. Um, Google Earth Outreach is a group at Google that travels around the world and teaches people how to use Google tools to fight to find environmental and social justice. So we were lucky enough to attend a two-day session hosted by the Institute there. We learned all about these tools. The collaboration between Google Earth Outreach and the Institute started years ago when they invited the head of Google Earth Outreach, Rebecca Moore, to present at um, Turning the Tide. And then deep end as Google Earth Outreach utilized the Institute for its own partner meetings. So hosting this two-day session was a great logical next step in deep deepening that collaboration. And we've been lucky that their partnership has now um, helped 80 people from environmental organizations around the world that's who attended this two-day session, as well as the four of us, um, our partners from the National Park Service and the Presidio Trust, some of whom were also in attendance at the session, and now all of you. So welcome. Um, the session had a train-the-trainer model, which means that we've been charged with coming back to our organizations and teaching all of you how amazing these tools are and how you can use them in your own lives. So um, we've learned many things including what's possible using Google Earth and Google Maps, how other organizations are using these tools for their own projects to create success, and we hope to inspire you and show you how to use them so that you can share what you're doing with your community and help other people get involved and support you. So Google's geographic tools are free, they're a powerful resource, and they tell the story of the park in a visual and accessible way, especially to the next generation. For those of you who already have some ideas for projects you'd like to use these tools for, we're looking forward to giving you a taste of what's possible using them. We hope you'll be inspired to learn more, and to that end, the four of us will be hosting a hands-on session later in the spring where we'll teach you exactly how to use them. Um, so if you are ready to jump in and create a Google Maps or Google Earth project for your program, and this sounds interesting, please let us know after the session today, and we'll make sure that we keep in touch with you about that hands-on session. And for those of you managers in the room, we're here today to let you know what's possible and get you excited about Google Earth and Google Maps so that you can support your team as they try to negotiate this learning curve. And if you have someone in mind on your staff who should attend this hands-on session, let us know that as well. So here's our agenda today. Google Earth and Google, Google Maps, they're two different things. I'm going to tell you how they're different. Why this matters, why should you care, why are we here? Ben is going to tell you. Then he'll show you some examples of what other organizations, other organizations that have done extraordinary projects using Google Maps and Google Earth, providing an important service to their constituents and moving their causes forward more easily than they would have otherwise. So we want to inspire you and give you some great examples from projects that have already happened. It's easy. Michael's going to show you just how easy it is to use these tools. You'll be shocked at just how much you can do right now without a lot of training or effort. We'd also like to demystify Google Earth for you and spark some ideas for how you can use these tools. And finally, resources. We've compiled a number of helpful resources to get you started and let you know where to find them. So, Google Earth and Google Maps. Two different things. Raise your hand if you've used Google Maps before. Yes. Raise your hand if you've used Google Earth before. So some of you have this great. Welcome to all of you in the room. Um, okay. Google Earth and Google Maps are two free tools relating to mapping information. Why does this matter to us? We have a lot of geographic data at the Parks Conservancy. Trails, visitor centers, restoration projects, native plant nurseries, native plants, raptors with radio tracking devices on them. Geographic data is surrounding us. 
We also care because we are a complex organization with audacious goals, and these tools can help us make our projects concrete. They can help us share them with people who can champion us in the community, and that's what we need sometimes to make these projects move forward. Google Maps and Google Earth can help us. Betty said yesterday we have over a million native plants that we've grown in the native plant nurseries over our history. That number sounds incredibly big, but it's hard to connect to. How about if we could put a pin on each place a volunteer has planted a plant in our parks in the past year? With the information about the nursery it came from, the type of plant, why it's important to be planted there, and how you can go volunteer to do the planting. What if we want to map a hike in our parks with information along the route about what our projects department volunteer front, volunteer programs and native plant program helped make happen there along the route? This is actually easy to do using Google tools. And it's free. And it's easy to share with other people. So Google Maps. Most of us know what these look like. They are 2D online <coughs> maps that you can find in a web browser. What if you are hosting a volunteer project, hike, or other event, and you want to give people driving directions to get there and tell them where the parking lot is? This is a great use of Google Maps. It's web-based, which means anyone can access it through their own browser. And it looks like this. So here's a great map that Tammy just made last week. And what this map is showing is all of our members across the country so she's able to show this to her colleagues in the retail store to encourage them and let them know that their efforts to sell memberships to tourists as well as locals is actually working. These are great things to use Google Maps for. Most of us have probably already used Google Maps, so you have a general idea about this, and Michael's going to show you some more um, engaging things that you can use Google Maps for a little bit later. Google Earth. satellite imagery of the Earth, both current and, and historic, so you can see how places have changed over time. It's 3D. Based on satellite imagery, you can see terrain. It's not just a bird's eye view, but a bird's experience. You can embed media like audio, video, and photos. You can create tours so people can see what you want.
students don't have Google Earth installed, you can also create a tour that's in YouTube and just give it to them in what they already have.
terms of the winning runners and how many people participated. San Francisco really doesn't get that many people. Um, and it's the hills, and it gives you a little elevation profile, which you can actually see a lot better down here. Um, and the temperature, which we like to attract people with. But really, the commanding thing on this site is the visuals. You get three things. One is a map that shows you the route here in blue. And another, which I'll pull up in a second, is Google Street View. I hope, I imagine a lot of people have seen this before, but what's really great is that this interacts, these, all these things uh, go together with the elevation profile. So, you know, we start, this is the beginning of the race, gives you all the hills in San Francisco, Golden Gate Bridge and everything. And the really fun thing is to imagine yourself as a runner going through, and you start out on Embarcadero, and you can see our character just gliding along effortlessly in the marathon there on this green carpet. Um, but it shows you what the marathon is going to be like. In a couple places it doesn't have information, but let's go all the way right onto the Golden Gate Bridge. And you actually get the experience a little bit of what it's like to run on the bridge. And you can take a second and you know, have a look around. <laughs> to us at the Institute, all of us that were there were just beaming at each other, like, oh, trails! We need to do this for our trails. Like, imagine if you could give people this kind of understanding of how difficult the trail is, what they're going to see along the way. And if we look at the New York City example, since it's the Wall Street Journal, they've you know, developed their New York Marathon information a little more. And they actually have these little green icons you can see where people are telling their stories. and they went and got testimonials from the winning runners in the race. So these pop up. Sorry, you can't read them, but um, here's one of the winners. And you know, he talks about what it's like at each step of the race. Um, it goes along, you know, telling more and more, and they give an image of each area. But just imagine being able to tell stories about people's experiences on the trails. Or we're having the Chrissy Field testimonials on Facebook. We could put that information up. Um, all right. But I'll move on and get off the marathon trip onto how conservation organizations have used Google Earth in sort of a more complex way. So Google has, within Google Earth, what's called the global awareness layers. And this is to educate us a little bit on what's going on around the world. We're just going to scratch the surface. I'm just going to show you this one example of many that they have in global awareness. Um, and it's about Appalachian mountaintop removal. Um, many of you may be aware that one of the greatest environmental catastrophes in the United States is mountaintop removal coal mining. Um, mountains are blown up up to 800 vertical feet or just <coughs> completely removed permanently for the extraction of coal, and that provides us with our electricity. It's hard to get a sense of these places from the ground. I mean, not only is it remote, but it's private, and really, it's, even if you were to go there, it's hard to grasp the entire scale. I mean, this is stretching across several states. Let me see if I can add on borders. But basically, you only really start to grasp the scale of this by getting an aerial view. Um, so one of the groups that contacted Google was a grassroots organization of five people called Appalachian Voices in North Carolina. Um, for years, they have been raising money and taking politicians to fly over the coal fields to see the over 400 blown up mountains there. And clearly this process was reaching a select few and these politicians weren't doing very much about it. Um, so they got in touch with Rebecca Moore from Google who had used the technology to stop a redwood logging plan up in California. Um, and they wanted to know how they could tell their story virtually, how they could get people motivated. And they outlined their goals as being Fourfold. To convey the massive scale of destruction caused by mountaintop removal coal mining while connecting users to the human communities that are impacted and the human tragedies caused by the destruction. Two, to link users to the web where they can learn more about mountaintop removal, read about the effort to end it, and most importantly, to take action to help stop it. Three is to provide a platform to create and engage a network of supporters who they can partner with on a long-term basis to end mountaintop removal 
And lastly, they wanted to develop a resource to educate and regularly update decision makers, media, bloggers, and other Americans about on top of Google. So after getting a training much like ours from Google Earth Outreach, they teamed up with six partners around the area to create what you see here, which is just a massive amount of content about mountaintop removal, and we're just going to start to talk about it. Um, let me fly us into one of the mines called the Hobet Mine Complex, and this is about 10,000 acres or so. What they've done is they've created a tour of what you know looks pretty abstract. So let's get right into it. There are a whole bunch of steps that'll take you through exactly how you know they blast the mountain, they clear the mountain how they get the coal out, but I'm going to go to this site and talk about what, what exactly are we looking at here. This actually used to be a riverbed, um, and it was completely filled with toxic debris, but it's considered to be legally remediated and recovered because these strips of grass here represent their remediation and their kind of restoration. Okay. Um, so let's look at what's behind it. And this is where the storytelling feature really comes in and is key to tell people what's actually going on. You see this image? This is what's actually under the soil. It's toxic debris that's full of mercury, selenium, and other substances that are leaking into people's drinking water around there. Now let's talk a little more about the communities. They have developed all this data to tell a story of each community that's affected by the mountaintop removal, and you just click on any of these little helmets and it'll tell you, you, know, you see an image of a mudslide here, and it gives an example of a three-year-old boy that was peacefully sleeping at night and was actually crushed by a boulder that came through his window and killed him. So, anyways, you know, this is all really heart-wrenching, but I'm gonna stop there and just go right into the question of why does this matter to us? We are so far away from this. The East Coast is basically, not literally, as close to us as Cuba. And we get our power from pg and &E, and we have a whole separate bunch of issues that we can deal with them about. Um, you know. <laughs> but really, the web will show us how we're all connected. And I'm going to go to their website, which is called ilovemountains.org. And the first thing it asks you is what's your connection to mountaintop removal? So we type in our zip code here, 94123, and show my connection. Pass us, yes, use pg &E, I assume. You are connected to mountaintop removal, in fact. Your electricity provider, pg and &E, buys bolts from company engaged in mountaintop removal. They give you a Google map here. I'm actually gonna bring it right into Google Earth. And it's this pretty incredible graphic that's telling us exactly where we're getting our power, thanks to PG&E. Here's the Stockton uh, power plant, and we're getting our power eventually from these mining sites in Appalachia. Actually, we can go right in to which mine it is, and as it turns out, we're getting our power from Black Mountain, Virginia, which is exactly where right here, you may not be able to read it. It's that story of a three-year-old boy. That's where we're getting our power. So, at any rate, um, I'll wrap up here, but that kind of awareness, just understanding how we connect to places, it's what has made this such a successful tool for their campaign. I mean, newspapers from around the country are writing up this story, and right up on the front page of their website, you can see how you can get involved, how you can you know, sign petitions, write your Congress people, et cetera. And you know, overall, I think the Appalachian mountaintop removal really brings to light um, how many different ways we can virtually show people our parks and our story and get them to care about and engage with these places. I mean, so much of our mission here is to give people a sense of ownership over the parks and how they relate to them. Um, and really, this last piece of putting in your zip code give you that sense of connection. I mean, if we can draw lines to where the nearest trailhead is, which is actually data that's being developed by a group called Transit and Trails. Um, but imagine also, where is your nearest volunteer program? Or you know, what are the endangered species that are closest to you? Or what programs do we have going on that you could fund? I mean, all these things could be instantly translated to somebody visiting our website or downloading our Google Earth information. Uh, it also highlights the importance of partnering, and you know, I said before, seven partners created all this data. There are a number of groups in the Bay Area. We spoke to some of them at the 
mission. So hopefully we can do that as we go forward. Um, and I think I'll stop there with Appalachia and go to my last example. Um, I want to show you guys just a little bit of how Google Earth is used to advocate for an issue that just about everybody, I think, I hope, can agree is important, but few people in our country get a chance to experience firsthand, and that's tropical deforestation. Um, I could, having grown up in Honduras, I could tell you all about you know, how that's affected me, but I want to go to the Amazon and show you guys a pretty inspiring story here. defende a floresta é, passa pela essa vida começaram a me ameaçar madeireiras, as pessoas já foram mortos bons liderados Chief Almir had seen Google Earth in an internet cafe in 2007 and he asked for our help his idea was if we could teach the young people how to use YouTube how to interview the elders, record this content, attach it to the Lord. It would be a way of sharing their culture with the world. <laughs> when we came down this year, we trained the Surui people on how to use a new technology using cell phones. So when illegal loggers penetrate their land, they'll be able to take photographs, videos that are GPS located, immediately upload to Google Earth, alert the law enforcement authorities, and use this as a way to protect the force. So who's ever responsible for enforcing the law? They can't deny that it happened anymore, because half a billion people around the world can see it with their own eyes. Tropical deforestation accounts for 20% of the greenhouse gas emissions that we all produce. Chief Almir Scott, many members of the tribe organized to replant the forest that had been illegally logged. Using cell phones, they can document what trees are there and where there's the blank areas and document their plans for planting so that they can gain access to the carbon offset marketplace. Durante 10 anos, a gente quer plantar mínimo, mínimo, um milhão de mudas. Everyone can do something to stop deforestation this year. Go to your country representative to that Copenhagen Climate Change Treaty and get your government to support RED.
the Smithsonian, the New York Times, the Chronicle, the independent newspaper in the UK, they're all over this story. And it's just blown up. And I, I'm pretty sure they're on their way to securing that carbon project. Um, but going back to the video, there are quite a few novel uses of the technology there. Um, one that you saw was using cell phones. Um, we actually did that at the Institute. We went around and took photographs of plants that were around Fort Baker. And you can develop, I mean, so much information about these. And it's not to say that we need to do this right now to tell our story. It's much more about this is where things are going. And we need to be right on the cutting edge with this, or at least, you know, at this head of quilt, how it's moving along, because there's quite a lot of work that's been done so far. Um, the younger generations just gobble this stuff up. I can imagine kids at Christie Field, I mean, we were talking yesterday at the all staff meeting for the Conservancy about how brilliant it would be if kids could go around, take a photograph of a plant, and instantly have from the internet information about that species. I don't think, you know, the face detection software that we have in iPhoto or whatever really translates just yet in that sense, but the ideas are there, and hopefully we can think of what's most relevant to us in that sense. Um, like I said, the things that I've shown are just scratching the surface of what other groups have done, and there's a lot more to explore. Michael will talk about resources that you can uh, use at the end of his talk. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Norelli, the GIS coordinator of the Parks Conservancy, and he's going to talk to you just how e about just how easy it is to use these tools. Okay, so we're dumping a lot of information on you. How is everybody feeling? You ready to dive in a little bit? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, of course, if you can marshal the resources of a lot of partnerships, you can create really rich content like we've seen here. Uh, ben mentioned that they used um, six or seven different organizations that all contribute to this and, and, and built this very rich information resource. Um, while I'm, I'm just going to scratch the surface on how it's possible to do some of this in maybe a smaller way, um, but so we can kind of see the path that we can head down if we wanted to create these kind of information resources. Um, can I just get a show of hands? How many people have actually used, uh, I saw how many raised for Google Maps. How many people have used Google Maps? <laughs> save their own content. Okay, great. So maybe some of this will be new information. That's where I want to start. So let's see here. So we'll go to Google Maps. I'm going to sign in as me. And it, it is a good thing to get a Google account because then you get access to all of the things that Google provides. Um, access to uh, YouTube, a, a YouTube account, a CASA account for storing photos and those kind of things. I don't know how you feel about the takeover of the world that Google is, is leading the charge into. No, that's kind of a joke. Um, but they do have their mission to gather up the world's information. So this is this is um, going to be a road down my face. Um, okay, so this here's your familiar Google Earth interface. You can zoom into an area of interest, and this is pretty typical, right? So you can put in, um, you know, do a search, and it'll lead you to where you want to go. There's a there's a, a link up here at the top that says Google My Maps, and uh, when I click this. It, shows you how you can create, or leads you into the um, part of the application where you can create your own map. Notice I've, I've done a few of these here. So um, I'm going to create a new map. And um, let's say, for my example, um, I was involved in November with um, a lot of conservancy staff to do a big planning out at Land's End. And I want to be able to uh, lead people to that location and give them a little bit of, um, of some rich content that kind of talks about my experience. So uh, I'm going to zoom in here, and uh, I can't really <coughs> see the, um, the slope that we were on, so I'm going to switch to the satellite view. Notice when I hover over this corner here, I get some more choices. Oh yeah, there it is. There's the slope that we were on, and we did all this great view vegetation work, and we were about right there. And um, here I can type in, this is my planting location, and since I'm doing um, titles and descriptions here, I should call this my um, planting day. And I can include a description. Um, here's where we were. Okay, and if I just save that now and uh, click done, now I can uh, click on this bubble and look, there's my title, my planting location title. Pretty straightforward. If I go back in and edit, I can pop up that bubble again and I get some choices. So I actually, um, you know, those familiar sort of Google icons are fine, but um, I want to add in my own 
my own special icon. And uh, I have, uh, if, well, let's see, let's, let's go to the internet here. I'm going to open up um, Qtab, oops, yeah, Qtab, and search, um, let's see, just in Google for um, wetland icon. Not maybe exactly appropriate for what we're doing here, but um, for the sake of example. Oh, there's a nice one. Okay, so I'm going to click on that one, and I'm going to right-click it and say copy image address. And I'm going to use that information inside of my Google Map. When I add an icon, I get this box pop up. I can paste in. Notice I didn't have to write any of this code. I'm just stealing from the internet, which is a tried and true <laughs> method for getting some really rich content. Um, so there's my watershed icon. Fantastic. And um, let's say I want to uh, include a picture. Uh, on the Parks Conservancy website, we have uh, people have really done some really wonderful things with um, image, um, adding uh, pictures to the website for the sake of the press mostly, and, and for people like me who steal code. Um, and I can go into this rich text uh, link here, click on add an image, and paste in this code, which is just a link to a, um, a JPEG, a regular old image file that's hosted somewhere on the web. I'll say OK, and look, the picture appears. So I'll say OK there, save and done. Now when I click on my, my location, bubble pops up. Hello. There we go. There's my picture. Look, there we were, right on the hillside. We were planting there. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so um, that's how you can add an image. Let's add a video. So once again, we'll go on, on the web. We can search through, um, let's say, YouTube. Just because they offer this pretty easily. And I'll do um, a search for that lance and planting video that I know is on there. And uh, let's see, where is it? Oh yeah, there it is. And down here at the bottom, there's a little embed code. It gives us some code. Again, if you're codophobic, just look away. Wait, let me stop this here. If you're codophobic, look away. Don't look at the code. It won't, won't hurt you, I promise. Um, we actually want to use the old embed code. And all you have to do is copy and paste. So there's, co um, there's my copy. And I can go back to Google Maps. And I can... photo 
and then also a little search function. So up here is, is the top. You saw me do this before. You can type in and acts just like Google Maps to search. It gives you some choices of different locations, and it saves the one you, you, you've been to. Down at the bottom here where it says layers, this is all content that comes with Google Earth natively. So this is all stuff that's in, installed along with Google Earth. Um, we get your typical borders and labels that, that kind of get more dense as you zoom closer in. Here's all the, the global awareness information that Ben talked about. And uh, there's roads. If I click that on, you can s start to see that the roads fill in. Right, roads? Turn this one on. There we go. So there's the roads that popped in that weren't there before, etc. And there's even 3D buildings. Uh, Wendy showed this in her demo that the Palace of Fine Arts is actually a, um, a 3D building of the Palace of Fine Arts that was built in a program, uh, a, a Google program, uh, called SketchUp which is a way that you can actually take cat information and make it three-dimensional, or basically just build three-dimensional objects that you can harvest then inside of Google Earth. And a lot of people have done this. Google has collected all of these and presented it as a 3D, 3D building slayer. Okay, and then going across the top here, we have um, some buttons that add uh, content. So if I hover over this one, you can see that add a place mark, add a polygon, add a path. Um, the three types of, thanks, three types of, of um, tree graphic information. Here you can add an image overlay and a recorded tour, which I'll talk about. And then there's the historical um, time slider, so you can go back and forth between um, historic images all the way up to the present day, or whatever they have um, loaded up. Um, and there are some other functions here I won't talk much more about, but you can explore that and actually take a, um, a, a tutorial from the resources that we'll show you at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna add some content. First thing I'm gonna do is add a place mark. Um, when I click on this, I get a, um, a properties page, and then here's our we can scoot that around and notice how the longitude and latitude change. This is actually a pretty good way to find out um, what the longitude and latitude is of a particular location just by scooting this place mark around. And I'll stop here and I'll type in near beach. And once again, if I want to, I can change my, um, my push pin to add a custom icon. The same thing, add an icon location that's, hard, that's uh, posted somewhere on the web and it'll be fed back into this and show up as a custom icon. In the, the, the Seward E Tribe one, there were some custom icons that showed little people and animals and things like that. That's how they did that. <coughs> and in the description field, it, the same thing, I can add uh, some rich content. <coughs> rich content being things like slideshows and pictures and those things. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, look, I actually even saved an icon file. from a Picasso slideshow. Once again, you don't have to know what it means, just copy it and paste it. But if you want to know what it means, there are lots of tools that will let you do that. And when I say OK, and I click on my button, there it is, the slideshow. Actually, this is a slideshow of uh, Chrissy Field <laughs> and the change over time, which I meant to do. That wasn't <laughs> with Flash about what might be possible and what we could do to show off this area. Um, certainly it was, a, it, was, it would be an interesting part of the story. Oh, I need to turn on the terrain here so you can see the 3D. There we go. The mountains pop up. Okay, so here's the Redwood Creek watershed. So Redwood Creek runs up here, around this ridge, and goes on back up, hugging the road here, and then goes up through Muir Woods up to Duncan, <coughs> Mount Shemmel Heights. So, we want to show that whole area as a tour. <coughs> what I can do is go into um, add a path, and once again I get that little properties page, and I get this tool over here where I can draw the line. And as I add little vertices along this line, I can keep going as far as I want to up the watershed. And Tour. So there I am flying over the line. 
that I just um, put in. This isn't canned, this is something that just we just now did. And if I want to um, show all of that and tell the story about it, I can turn off the path and describe the um, des describe things as they go by. Whoa, hey, I, can the I can even change the view as we go, so you can stop and look. Oh, look, there's Mancucci. Oh, no, stop. Okay, you get the idea. So you can actually um, change your experience as the, the, the tour goes through. And here's the really fun thing. Um, Okay, so I have some locations here in a demo I cooked up earlier. So I want to be able to show some um, interesting places on the way before we tell our story about, um, about uh, Redwood Creek. Um, here is an example of an image overlay. Um, so you can click this image overlay um, button here, and then it lets you browse for a photo and drop it in and scoot around um, um, the edges of the photo to be able to show what we're seeing here, which is photo that is comparing, this photo is taken from 1972, it shows the top of Hawk Hill against what's actually there now. Now one of the issues that we were working with in the Conservancy was that we were making a plan to cut down all the, a lot of the trees up on top of Hawk Hill. And we wanted to be able to show the communities that were concerned about this that these trees were introduced later on um, and didn't represent something that had been there historically over time. So one of the really great things is that we had a photo that showed it. So we can, we can represent it here and show, okay, well, there weren't any trees in there in 1972, and then here are the trees that were, were going to be cut down. It's like, no, you can't do it. Okay, well, in any case. Um, but here's our place mark that's uh, representing that area. If I click on it, it zooms to that location. Here's um, another place mark that I've saved. Now, up the Rodeo Valley, and then finally back to our Muir Beach parking lot, which had some content that I authored there. Great. Okay, so that's, that's showing how we can um, get to that location. Now, if I wanted to save this as a tour, start back at the beginning here. Click on my Add Tour button. I get a new box down here that has a little recording symbol in the microphone. And now I can start my tour. So I'll turn on the recorder, and then I'll go to these different place marks. Up, up, in a way. <laughs> Our park mapper site. These links are offered to support your efforts. 
Earth, you create beautiful information applications using Google Earth and Google Maps. At the start, start at the top there, the very first link is the Google Earth Outreach Team, and um, that's a great place to start because not only does it have um, lots of information about what Google Earth Team does, like the examples that we saw, but also has video tutorials. So you can teach yourself how to do this, and it's very, very simple, hopefully, as you just discovered. Um, we were hoping to maybe engage you in a little bit of a dialogue about what possible stories might be out there that would be appropriate for telling using these tools. But hopefully we can continue that conversation, check back into the resources page, that resources page, and we'll distribute it to everybody who's RSVP'd or has signed up on the list in the back. We'll send you an email with sitesgoogle.com slash site slash parkmapper, a mouthful. But hopefully there'll be a lot of great information there and we'll be harvesting your ideas about how we can produce uh, good content for the park. I really want to thank you for um, uh, spending your time with us today. And we are available to help you as you maybe take this idea and run with it and uh, are looking forward to hearing about your stories and the stories you want to tell and the ways that we can tell them with these tools. Thanks very much. Oh yeah, we have some questions. Um, I just and we have a few minutes, so. I just want to let you guys know, who's at the February 17th public program that Rebecca Moore spoke at? We sold out in two hours. A There's couple of you were there. Anyway, if you want to see it, it's on the Institute's uh, website in our video gallery. Would you mind pulling up the Institute's sure. homepage? It's institute at goldengate.org, and then in the left now there's a video gallery. And you can see all of the examples that Ben showed in more detail. And then also there were a couple of speakers um, from the Sierra Club and Green Info Network on how they use Google Earth. So it's an hour long. You can fast forward if you if you like, but it, it's a really nice resource that's out on our own website. So institute at learning curve of learning GIS 
um, out into a form that's really easy and accessible with a free tool that is three agency compatible. Anybody who has the plugin can view the Google Earth from any agency. And then, of course, you can harvest a lot of stuff through Google Maps just through your regular browser that we all have on our machines. So this is really kind of leaping over the interagency walls to, to um, help us collaborate uh, across the three agencies to take care of this beautiful, beautiful way. Oh. Yeah. I, I saw you were using uh, Google Earth Pro in that uh, The only differences between Google Earth Pro and the, the regular plain vanilla Google, the free one, are um, import of GIS natively, and there are some actually some issues with that. It's not as nice as you can get from taking GIS information in a third-party application to convert to KML. Mm -hmm. The Google Earth Pro is designed to harvest GIS shapefiles natively. Um, and then also turning a tour, like you saw, into um, a, um, a recognized video file, like an AVI file or an MPEG file. Um, so it does that natively, too. Also. Um, with Google Earth Pro, you can print out uh, high-density uh, aerial photos. Some of the stuff that you get from the regular version um, isn't quite nice enough to, to unroll on the plotter, for example, at huge scale. But Google Earth Pro is able to do that. We have a couple of licenses in the park that we got as a grant from the Google Earth Outreach Team, our best buddies. Um, and uh, it is possible we, we, we would be willing to open up the conversation with them to grant us some more licenses for Google Earth Pro if it seemed like um, that were needed. And then also, as a condition of us granting the Google Earth Pro, they want to see what we've done. They want us to prove to them that we're actually using this, this tool for what it's designed for. So we'll be looking around for our mountaintop removal story, the one that's really compelling, that'll be able to um, engage all of the people that we need to engage, but then also show uh, the Google Earth team that we're actually using the tool for their